Well, I would like to thank everyone for coming to today's meeting and presentation, uh, which I've titled The Common and Misplaced Racism, Racism of Darwin Hitler and David Duke. Uh, in the real world, I am Stephen Gazer, and I have uh, had a career in doing biology teaching research and uh, doing virtual world education. And so this is a talk that is something that's been uh, germinating in my mind for some time to really try and bring some biological perspective to this concept that uh, we've created called racism. And it seems like now is a, a perfectly great time to try and inject some rational conversation and dialogue into the topic. So to start, I do just want to uh, remind people of kind of the, the dictionary definition of racism, which is a prejudice or discrimination or antagonism against another group of people based on the belief that they are inferior to you. And now there are some subtleties to these definitions. And so in some cases, one can define it as looking down upon groups with distinct physical characteristics. Uh, however, it can also be a cultural perspective. And so, uh, again, one example we'll be talking about is that, again, while Jewish people are very white and Caucasian, they are discriminated against even though by what you would call the white supremacists in the United States, even though they don't really have many distinct physical differences. Although again, one can, uh, and this is very fair, to talk about the genetic heritage differences between between groups. And so this is a, a term I've, I feel like I've coined it, and it's something that again is a reflection of one's genetic background. And so one can certainly have a cultural identity of being black, like our most recent very eloquent president in the United States. Uh, but of course, his genetic heritage would actually be half white and half African descent. So I think that's an important distinction. And one thing I will be uh, touching upon in some cases is this, this cultural racism. But the majority of my talk, and being a biologist, I want to focus on this idea of genetic heritage. Okay. So any biological conversation really comes down to a, a reminder of how we describe the evolution of species over time. And so this was something that was, again, brought forth. This genesis comes from Charles Darwin. And there are some key features to how evolution works. And that is individuals in a population vary in their genetics and the characteristics that they inherit and can pass on to the next generation. And in some cases, when that genetics is variable and the conditions of the environment or uh, some sort of mating selection game, uh, some people produce more children than others at a proportional rate. Uh, and in some cases, you can have, for example, a, a viral or a bacterial plague where some people exhibit resistance and others do not. So they will pass on those favorable traits, and those traits can increase in the population. And what I have here in the lower right-hand corner is an image from on the from uh, Darwin's notes and on the origin of species, describing this idea that when you think about distinct species that exist, they are branches from a common ancestor. And so this idea of ancestry is again a key component of how we view the relatedness of uh, organisms on the planet and their historical background. So as a kind of easy visual example of these types of things that occur is our foxes. And so uh, like many species, uh, there are Arctic variations. And you can notice that there are some, again, very clear and distinct visual adaptations to that colder environment. Uh, and again, the coloration of the environment, I should say. That again, if you have lots of snow, then it's much better to have white coloration yourself in order to, again, either escape predation or to be better at sneaking up on your prey. Uh, and so that's, again, even though the red fox and the Arctic fox are related, uh, they, again, develop distinct features 
related to their environment that helps them adapt. And now again, one thing that's not that's hard to portray in this picture, of course, is that there are a lot of other physiological adaptations to the cold. And so if you actually look at the heat distribution, the, uh, the ability to retain heat, the ability to retain fat, uh, these are all things that vary between two species. And in fact, the red fox is, I think, something about 150% the size of the average Arctic fox. And so again, these are things that develop over time. Uh, again, I don't know, I haven't talked to any, I don't know if foxes are racist about that, but who knows. Again, but again, I do want to point out that these are distinct species and that depending on the genetic coding of both their behavior as well as their gametes, they um, are distinct species that uh, do not produce or do not typically mate or produce likely viable offspring. Although, again, I don't know if that's been tested in this specific case. Another example of evolution is that's very visual and easy to see is in bears. And what I find always very interesting about bear evolution is that, again, the very deep root of this is a carnivore, something whose primary nutritive and energy calorie source is uh, meat, uh, that given the right environmental conditions and the right you know, genetic adaptations, they can become completely vegetarian. And there actually are lots of interesting adaptations that pandas have in order to be able to eat bamboo shoots. Uh, they have this the so-called panda's thumb is this adaptation of a bone that allows them to strip the bamboo. But of course, another reminder, another visual component of bear evolution, of course, is the polar bear that has, again, adapted its coloration to be more efficient and a better predator in the Arctic. Uh, again, one thing that's uh, that I do know about that has been published is that even though polar bears and brown bears have about 2 million years of divergence in terms of evolution, there are reported examples of so-called hybrids. So grizzly bears and polar bears that have interacted produced viable offspring uh, that is, you know, half and half, half polar, half grizzly bear. But it's not clear. I haven't read anything about whether the offspring of those are viable. So again, distinct species, but depending on the mechanisms of how different species uh, interact with each other, they may or may not still have the capacity to interbreed, but they're considered separate species because they do not routinely interbreed. And so this concept is uh, codified in biology known as these barriers to reproduction. And there are two phases at which this can interact. There's the idea that Two, um, again, nascent species or distinct species, they don't overlap in their habitat. So they might have the capacity to have viable offspring, but in fact, they are geographically isolated and do not interact. Uh, there's also sexual isolation by behavior or conduct. So if you think about a lot of the mating rituals of birds, that those have very specific um, uh, visual cues that lead to mating, as well as say, for example, songbirds, it's very specific in the song coding. Or you can have other mechanical isolation that has to do with, uh, you know, body parts. And then also gametic isolation. And one of the best examples of gametic isolation is in flowers, where pollen can have very different interactions with the, the ovules in that they don't um, burst if you don't have the right combination of chemical signals. Uh, other isolation mechanisms that occur after breeding would be, again, after the fusion of, say, a sperm and an egg, is that the zygote itself does not become viable or that uh, the actual offspring, while well, they may you know, get born and they die shortly, and hybrid sterility. Again, one of the best examples of hybrid sterility is the mule, which is a combination of a horse and a donkey. Again, horses and donkeys have about 6 million years of separation. And so, again, it's, they're capable of interacting, they're capable of having offspring, but, uh, and actually, and mules have a pretty good, what's called hybrid vigor, but they themselves cannot produce more mules. So again, these are, the one thing that's important to keep in mind is that over time, temporal isolation, as you develop into a new species, invariably with enough time, leads to incompatible chromosomes and incompatible sexual mechanisms that lead to viable offspring. Okay, so another example that people can relate to uh, that's different than talking about species, but you can see a wide variety of phenotypic 
differences, again, physical characteristics, is in dog breeds, right? So the domestic dog, uh, again, there's a little bit of um, refinement that people are working on, but uh, it looks like their common ancestor with wolves was, you know, 10 or 15, or they were domesticated from a wild animal about 15, 20,000 years ago. They have co-evolved with humans. And in that time, they've been domesticated and undergone very rigorous, what's called, what Darwin called artificial selection. So again, we specifically found dogs with particular traits, either physical or behavioral, and then kept inbreeding them in a way that they became very distinct uh, in terms of their behavior, their interactions with each other and physically. But one thing to keep in mind in this idea of dog breeds is that they are still one species. Okay, and so the, by definition, dog breeds what can produce viable offspring, and so that is still considered one species. And so again, they can produce viable offspring, but of course, one question I have is, you know, how particularly enjoyable and how does that work in some cases? And again, this can be done artificially by, by humans. But the other point is that, you know, if these were allowed to exist in the wild, let's say civilization collapsed, I think one thing we would see over a short period of time is a distinct speciation of dogs because of, again, quite distinct physical uh, uh, characteristics. Okay. So, again, this is just kind of an introduction to, to this topic of thinking about racism and that... Uh, the term racism really refers in a you know, parallel sense to this idea of breeds that you have, say, in dogs or cattle, that we are still one species, because by definition we do interbreed, but um, uh, do have distinct physical and then some nascent genetic di differences that lead to those physical differences. Uh, yeah, I would start if, uh, if again, if civilization collapsed, I'm pretty sure I would start too. So let's talk about some of the, the luminaries in a, a sense of, um, or prominent people in history that have had commentary on, on race. And so Charles Darwin, again, most well known for 1859, the publication of On the Origin of Species. And again, if you have not read this, it is a pretty accessible document to, um, you know, to a non-scientist. And so I actually do highly recommend it. I think there are some areas where the specific examples he talks about have been refined. And there's also a really nice documentary called What Darwin Never Knew that updates and provides some molecular and genetic information that's relatively modern. So again, very nice documentary, What Darwin Never Knew. Uh, but Darwin actually, you know, he is actually pretty well published. And one of the other uh, follow-up works he had was in 1871, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And so, again, what he really does try and focus in on is these interactions between humans and also set up the idea of mating selection. And again, this is one thing where he talked about natural selection, and that was largely taken in the context of thinking about the environment uh, and he didn't, he touched upon differences that could evolve because of mating preferences. But this one was one that went a little bit more in depth into that. So, uh, again, so what was, in a sense, Darwin's racism? And again, if you were to, to read this, you would notice he would have a dichotomy of the so-called civilized races versus the millennium lower or savage races. Uh, so, you know, that was the terminology at the time. And one thing to keep in mind is that Victorian England was not necessarily the most uh, politically correct. And, um, well, in certain ways, not the most civilized of civilizations in terms of, again, viewing other people. Uh, and that within the book, Darwin did argue that civil that this idea of civilization will supersede the savage. And again, he wasn't necessarily calling for, you know, a so-called race war, but just that over long periods of time, that was his his trend. And so again, I think if you were 
And then also one of his earlier documents in writing uh, from his voyages on the Beagle, uh, they actually had a Foygan, which was a South American native that had actually been living in England and was undergoing a kind of civilization uh, treatment. And they actually were dropping it off in that village. In that village, and one of the notation he had was that one could hardly make oneself believe that they are fellow creatures. Now again, that's young Darwin, and I think um, you know if you were to read this, you would get a sense of the Victorian racism that does underlie. And again, using these types of words uh, would not really be acceptable in terms of how we view different different races on the planet. Uh, now, I think, and I, I've read some people who have tried to analyze what Darwin's actual views were, and uh, there are several scholars who distinctly argue that, um, that Darwin was actually very advanced in his thinking, almost in the sense that compared to contemporary scientists at the time, uh, was not making the case that Caucasians were somehow a highest form of mankind. Uh, there were actually many who argued against sa the savages being of common ancestry as the Caucasian. The, um, you know, if anybody want to guess how, how kind of bad it was for savages in terms of thinking about class status in Victorian England, What, what comparison can be made that they were worse than? You know, just, uh, no, not rats, that's animals. No, it, not, not quite, not quite. In terms of the, the ladder of life, the Scala Natural, they were, again, still above that. No, they were actually considered, considered worse than, than women. And so if that tells you anything about the savages in Victorian England, that's that's what it was. And again, I think you know some people's impression of Darwin's uh, literature was saying that he really was trying to emphasize unity with the species. But um, oh, worse, oh, sorry, tagline. If you didn't catch it, worse than women, they were considered worse. Than. Okay, so now again, uh, I think. Well, again, so I think I don't have a deep scholarship in terms of Darwin's personal uh, journals or writing about his views on racism. But again, if one were to read it from a contemporary point of view, one would probably conclude some degree of, of racism, uh, even from a biological status. Okay, so let's move on to Hitler, uh, someone who typically needs very little introduction in this area. Uh, but I do want to make sure that we talk specifically about what his, um, what, the specificity of his racism. And so this is a quote from him that the stronger, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. The stronger must dominate and not mate with the weaker. And that would sacrifice the idea of one's higher nature. Um, and he says that if such a law did not direct the process of evolution, again, the stronger over the weak, then the higher development of organic life would not be conceivable at all. And I think this is thinking about Darwin halfway. Okay, so one of Darwin's catchphrases in on the origin of species is um, well, okay, actually, it's Richard Spencer who that we could talk about this is the survival of the fittest and the ability of this, the so called quote unquote stronger to survive. Uh, that is somewhat true. Again, the stronger you are when strength is a useful adaptation is, of course, an advantage. But, you know, what, for example, do like does a white fur color for an Arctic fox that is now smaller and physically weaker than a red fox say about strength? And so I think this is the important thing that, um, again, Hitler's narrow view is that he, and this is common of people of his time in Europe, that they equated strength with the best fitness. And I think we need to keep in mind that that's not the case. That is not even what Darwin was saying, but that that is his interpretation. Now, in follow-up, in terms of what one thinks about specific racism, is, uh, again, he had this Aryan race concept, again, some sort of mythical progenitor species or sub race of humans. Um, 
that does have this kind of supernatural uh, Christian origin to it. And uh, his argument was that interbreeding with so-called lower racers, or even just mixture of races at all, leads to a weakness of that. And again, I think I, one thing I will hopefully prove to you by the end is that the idea of race mixing is actually a benefit and a positive in terms of g promoting genetic diversity. But again, this is one thing that he had the basic tenet that some sort of racial purity in terms of one's genetics was a key part to one's strength. Uh, again, tagline mentions uh, social Darwinism, and yes, that was certainly an outcropping a branch of Darwin's theories that were promoted by sociologists. Again, it was largely, in my understanding, something promoted by rich people in America, as well as other countries, but primarily rich people in America to really justify uh, class warfare. Uh, again, there were justifications. I, I, again, I'm not familiar with the Irish starving to death story, but then in terms of American, um, yeah, and slavery as well in America, great example that uh, because you already are at the top of a social Darwinism class, that you can kind of justify whatever you want over the so called lower races. But it really was a way of maintaining the class warfare and had very little to do with anything related to genetics. All right, so. Um, let's move on to uh, David Duke. Again, David Duke is someone that I actually lived within, I think, 15 miles of when I was in college down in Louisiana. So I, but I'm really, and I'm going to focus on his quotes, but just to, re, to remind you, he was a grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Again, what some people call like the third iteration of the Klan. The, the Klan, of course, goes all the way back to post-Civil War, and there have been three main movements of it. And so he really represents the most recent um, the most recent example of this. Uh, and again, his his racism is not the same as Hitler's. And so this is a longer quote. And I'm just going to again paraphrase paraphrase and summarize some key points, which is that the Caucasian Christian represents Europe and that Europe is, um, should maintain both this association of the Christian and white race. And of course, having come to America, that idea of Caucasian Christian supremacy uh, should be paramount in terms of maintaining this idea. And actually, one funny thing too is that he really even mentions Christmas carols. And so one thing to keep in mind is that the, the racism of the Klan is very strongly associated both with the coloration, as well as a cultural phenomenon within America. The, um, yeah, and so that Pandy mentions that, again, in terms of the views of the Klan, they, uh, again, most well known, of course, for um, prejudice against uh, the African Americans. But of course, the Jewish. And if you actually go to, and not that I necessarily recommend it, but go to the DavidDuke.com website, you can see again there's a wide variety of racism that has to do with uh, Muslims as well as Jewish, and this whole idea of a Jewish conspiracy. Um, let me go to the next quote. So now, what's a little bit different about David Duke compared, say, to uh, Adolf Hitler? is that this idea, not necessarily, while they, while they do view themselves as superior, their main stated gripe is not necessarily that, at least as David Duke says it, that you should oppress the black in order to have white supremacy. It's just that the white supremacy should be maintained and blacks can do what they want. They can have you know whatever they want and they should be in a sense equally treated within the eyes of government law, as long as there's a separation between them. And so, uh, again, this top quote, that they're complaining about anything that changes the balance. So affirmative action, which is trying to, you know, push involvement in education or the workforce, uh, maybe that that's, if you do that above the proportional representation of blacks in American society, that is an unfair model because it takes away from the whites. Uh, 
Well, okay, so yeah, just, just to make sure I'm clear and tagline mentions this is that, again, this idea of an Aryan race would not include the Jewish ancestry. Okay, so that the Aryan race is distinct, even though, um, you know, from a genetics point of view, they're both white. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing, too, I just want to point out with David Duke, especially as compared to Hitler, is just the very strong association of religion with the idea of a physical characteristic. I'm getting a little bit of background from someone, although I'm not seeing it on voice. Is there stranger, stranger, can you um, mute your mic? Uh, okay, so again, this hard association of Christianity to um, this cultural identity of being European white uh, and Aryan is very distinct in in the clan perspective. Okay, so uh, these are some of the personalities and how it relates to this viewpoint. And, and, and at least with, with David Duke and Hitler, there's this idea of a racial purity and not, not race mixing. Uh, so let's talk about the genetics of the physical characteristics that vary in the human population. And I think the one that we will focus on first, the one that I, is the most common, I would say, at least in terms of American culture clashes, is skin pigmentation. So skin pigmentation basically has to do with the amount of a compound known as melanin in the skin. And there are biosynthetic pathways that create and distribute this in, um, in tissues, uh, specifically a cell type known as the melanocyte. And so the, now that we actually can look at the world all at one time, right? We actually have the idea of a circular map. We have the idea of the earth going around the sun and we can measure the amount of, of light. We can come up with a viewpoint for why such coloration may exist and vary within populations. And so this slide, a very quick summary of the idea that if you live near the equator, the amount of sunlight, and specifically the amount of UV light that is hitting directly and that you're exposed to is much higher than the more polar regions of the planet. Okay, so one thing that's very key and one thing that you're probably all recommend, like, when they tell you to go to the beach, what does everyone say to do before you go to the beach? Yeah, cover up, sunblock, sunscreen, wear a hat, uh, reapply the sunscreen if you go in the water, all sorts of stuff. And these are very important recommendations because one thing we know about UV light is that it will interact with DNA, the DNA will cause mutations, and that can lead to DNA damage and cancer. And one thing we definitely don't want is cancer, and so that's bad. And so the idea here is that, uh, and again, I don't know, I'm not familiar with all the chemistry of the interaction, but this melanin compound has the ability to absorb this UV light so that the protein is getting uh, damaged and absorbing and interacting and not your DNA. And so again, the key thing about dark coloration is uh, basically a survival advantage when there are high levels of incident light. Now, but what does that explain? But what's but why would that change, right? Why would you necessarily need lower amounts of melanin in the higher um, latitudes or lower latitudes? And so the um, important thing here, and this is something I, I just I really find odd that a lot of people don't know is that UV light is incredibly useful for the highest levels of vitamin D production. And so vitamin D, of course, is very important for developing bones. Again, vitamin D is very important in the body for a lot of reasons. But the, the basic disease you get if you're deficient in vitamin D, the one that is the most harmful to a person is rickets very weak bones and connective tissue. And so that is a distinct disadvantage. If you have lots of melanin and you're living in northern climates, then, um, yeah, especially before technology, 
this was horrible. Now again, what's one thing that we have here in America, and I don't know about Europe, that uh, makes the University of Wisconsin-Madison very rich in terms of our diets? Anybody want to hazard? You guys know this. I'm just going to wait for someone to say it. Oh, uh, no, no, not fish. Yeah, milk. Vitamin D supplements in milk, right? This is something that you see on the shelves every day, and the reason it's there is to prevent rickets in um, modern culture. Again, one of the downsides for many African Americans, though, is the fact that they are lactose intolerant, and so that can actually be not a great source of vitamin D. So they should still make sure they get a decent amount of sun. All right, so uh, and the thing that, and this is the thing, right, is why make a big deal of a phenotypic characteristic that is just saying in the genetic heritage, in the, in the long distant past, or not so distant past, these were survival advantages. They really don't say anything else about the value or, or worth of a human being. And yet, and that's one reason why I think in many ways, of course, culture is a key point of racism. So let's talk about a few more examples. I'm sorry, actually, there was Dave, Dave Miami had a comment, and I'm going to scroll back really quickly because it was something I did want to. Um... Oh, yeah, so Dave mentions modern genetic studies at Harvard have shown only a 50% difference among the races. And this is actually something that even Darwin was mentioning, is that he thought the differences within races in terms of phenotypic characteristics was actually greater than the differences between races. And this was an argument in his mind that, you know, we're one species and that these differences within races is, is again, you know, genetic variation, but that we have this common ancestor. Uh, again, I'm not sure of the specific percentage. Uh, again, when you think about, um, yeah, the, the, but uh, yeah, it has been genetically shown that the variations between species is less than the variation among individuals within, sorry, within a race. All right, so next slide, here's another example of an association of a genetic variation that's actually beneficial, as well as the geographic distribution of a selective predator. And so what we have here on the left is the percentage of the population that has the sickle cell and allele. Again, the presence of a variation of hemoglobin, again, changes in structure of hemoglobin. And on the right side is the prevalence of malaria. And so what we do know from biology is that if you have one copy of the sickle cell allele, the hemoglobin S, but, and one normal copy of hemoglobin, that actually helps protect you against malaria. That is a protective effect. And uh, while it's unfortunate that your homozygous for, if you have two copies of the S allele, the hemoglobin S, then in fact you die early on. Again, with modern technology, a lot of these people can live into their 20s, but um, there's a strong advantage to being a heterozygous for this trait in areas where there's a lot of malaria. Another example of this has to do with dehydration resistance and cystic fibrosis. So, so again, cystic fibrosis, you would know that as a disease where the lungs get clogged with mucus and people cough, and they, again, in their early 20s or teens, without strong medical intervention will typically die, uh, largely from bacterial infections. The, um, the relationship, though, is that if you have one copy of the cystic fibrosis allele, which is in a uh, chloride transporter protein, that's what's shown up here, that you become less efficient at dehydrating. And so if you get, say, cholera, and again, cholera was, in fact, the cholera is gone around the world in various stages, but there were strong uh, epidemics in Europe for, for many years, is that people who had one bad copy of the protein that was inefficient, they actually survived cholera better because they didn't dehydrate. And so again, this is a, a key point in that these genetic variations can lead to survival advantages when the environment is creating strong selective pressures. Okay, so let's, let's bring us back into thinking about genetics. Now, uh, this is a Punnett square, and this is just a reminder that if you have two individuals who are having children, and let's just, again, for sake of argument, they're, they're heterozygous for, say, cystic fibrosis, there's a one in four chance of producing lethality in their offspring. 
But again, the advantage, reminder is, the advantage is that they're heterozygous children, where there's one half chance they have a survival advantage in those, in those situations. So again, that is one reason that argues the prevalence of something that kills people as a homozygous recessive is, you know, pretty prevalent within those populations. Now, when we stretch this back out to think about population genetics, uh, if you are a heterozygous person, let's just say you know that, or you had someone in your, in your family had the disease, so there's a strong likelihood you could be heterozygous. What is your choice? And again, this is the, the box of chocolates argument uh, that you don't know what you're going to get, right? But the likelihood that a, an individual that you're going to have offspring with has this allele to, in, you know, to, to pass down to the offspring is equal to its incidence in the population, okay? And the point that I think is really important to think about is that if you are African-American, and there's a decent possibility that you have sickle cell traits, because malaria and no other selective pressure are selected for that gene, if you're a Caucasian or an Asian, has an extremely low likelihood of having chemical, uh, the sickle cell trait. And conversely, African Americans are extremely unlikely to have the cystic fibrosis uh, transporter defect. And so, one thing to, to kind of have perspective on this is that if you outcross to a distant genetic heritage, the child, the likelihood of having a homozygous recessive child, you know, someone affected with one of these types of diseases, is basically near zero. It's never zero because random mutations can occur, but it's essentially saying, you know, if you want to maximize your likelihood, of offspring that do not have recessive diseases, you should be looking for someone with a more distant genetic heritage. And that would be belied by their physical characteristics. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to pass through are a few examples of where um, examples of genetic diseases in what we call distinct uh, populations that have that have, in essence, had a type of inbreeding. Okay, so the first one I'll mention, uh, something that we, again, commonly refer to as polydactylism, although it's, it's specifically Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, that has to do with, uh, again, skeletal development not working correctly. And so you notice that in the picture, the person has some perpendicular six fingers. So again, polydactylism. Uh, what we do know is that this is really most found and only prevalent in Amish populations that have had so-called founder effects. So again, there's a high degree of relatedness in the population to an ancestor that, again, carried this mutated allele. Uh, there are some examples in island populations as well. So again, if you don't have the opportunity or some sort of cultural or social restriction says you have to stay within this community of breeding, these are things that become more prevalent. Again, another example, and this is what I didn't know. I actually just found this out um, this morning. I was looking for more examples. Uh, deafness in Martha's Vineyard. Anybody else know about this one? Uh, so apparently there was, again, from the early settlements of Martha's Vineyard, uh, there was a guy named Jonathan Lambert. And so, again, they had small populations. They tended to intermarriage. And so the incidence of deafness is actually 1 in 25, which is something that I find to be Pretty amazing. Uh, they actually, in a sense, this, this actually started to affect their cultural population, which is that they developed their own. They, people became very proficient at sign language as a, as a as a uh, you know response to this type of, of genetic prevalence or disease prevalence. Okay, again, another quick example. Uh, let's talk about ancient Egyptians. Okay, so one of the things that was a, a key and critical part of Egyptian um, Royalage is that you would not interbreed with the commoners. And so, uh, what's, but people have now been studying the mummies, uh, both with topographic scans, uh, again, not looking at per se their genetics, because that's considered illegal. You should not take any sort of material, even a small snippet of DNA from a mummy. But that when you analyze Tutankhamun's remains, uh, he, <laughs> he had a variety of physical ailments that likely contributed to his early death. Uh, and again, if you didn't know about his lineage, his um, mother was also his aunt. Uh, and then I'm also showing here uh, 
an earlier dynasty, Amenhotep I, he had, again, a very high, what would they call, um, incest rating scale. And as I recall, he was also, um, I can't remember if it, I think he was the offspring of his father and one of his father's cousins. So, again, this type of thing, again, when you go back and think about this, is that this idea of purity in, say, with a royal bloodline uh, led to an accumulation of recessive mutations and maybe other fitness and fitness impairments in the genetics or epigenetics. And that it really probably helped contribute to the downfall of that society in certain ways. And so, again, these types of decisions are, you know, in hindsight, not wise. But of course, if you have other ways of thinking about your place in the universe of being royal and above the commoners, uh, it can lead to this type of, of process. Okay, so uh, just to kind of bring us back to the math, in that when we think about the population genetics, again, if you're someone who, again, you might be heterozygous for some disease traits, or you're, you, or you know you are, you've had genetic testing, then if, in the opposite of the idea of outcrossing, if you are staying within some sort of subpopulation, some distinct population of that either went through a genetic bottleneck, or a lot of people are related to one common ancestor, or just again a lot of intermarriage, interbreeding, you're actually increasing that probability of that re other recessive allele being uh, passed down to your offspring as you pass one down as well. Uh, so again, I, I hope with these examples and thinking about the math and genetics. The idea of, of racial purity is just a nonsensically bad idea. And that is um, that these are the types of things that accumulate and become more probable. And that the idea of racial purity is not something that's useful for evolution or natural selection. And in fact, um, because one, again, all organisms are constantly accumulating fresh uh, mutations in their DNA. Again, sometimes those are beneficial. And again, I don't, all of us are the result of a small number of individuals who had positive mutations that were allowed to spread within and lead to, you know, all of us having a common ancestry and common advantages uh, in our genetics of being human. Nonetheless, um, you want to make sure that you then reestablish diversity within a population. And tagline mentioned something too that when we think about again, I wanted to keep my talk very specific to human biodiversity, but when we think about cheetahs, elephants, um, lots of other uh, conservation efforts for endangered species, it's not only that they want a certain number of individuals, it's that they're always trying to maintain the genetic diversity in these monitored and endangered populations. Um, let's see. Oh, and yeah, actually, he points out too that again, if you have a prized lion that looks physically stronger and is one of the best ones, then um, as a hunter, those are the ones you want. And in fact, if you are killing those selectively, then you're actually allowing a little weaker genetics in terms of the less uh, bigger lions. But kind of an interesting, okay, I don't, I didn't put this in preparing my talk, but kind of an interesting case that has been seen in the world's fisheries is that the average size of fish. Of adult fish is becoming smaller, and the speed at which they reach maturity and then interbreed is actually becoming younger among the fish as well. And so that's actually been a response to the nets, right? The nets easily capture larger fish, and so the smaller fish have had a selective advantage. And this is something that's actually been measured in the span of, say, decades. So it's a nice example of microevolution. Okay, so the, the last part of my talk, I want to mention some ideas of where having genetic diversity is a big positive in the human population. Okay, so uh, there's these things called major histocompatibility complex, or again, in humans, more specifically, leukocyte haplotype antigens. Is that right? LHJ. They, um, these are molecules in cells that um, take the fragments of proteins from bacteria and viruses and put them back on the surface of cells so that the immune effectors, things like antibodies, and T cells can learn to recognize the invading pathogens and kill them more effectively. And so this, again, this is very important for immune function. And the better this works, and the better these proteins are able to complex and bind these fragments of bacteria and viruses, 
the better your immune response will be. And everyone likes to have a good immune response. And what we now know is that the gene variability in MHC class molecules in, again, a wide variety of vertebrates, but then also specifically well do documented in humans, is that the more diversity you have within these molecules, the more fit you are. So again, another example where the idea of fitness doesn't have to do with how strong you are. It has, say, the, the ability or re relates to the ability to fend off pathogens. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a story that's been accumulating as people were doing genetics. They were finding these examples, finding the diversity. But here's a question for you. How does one help accomplish this diversity within the idea of a mating scheme? Right? You don't get barcodes to know if someone's similar to you or different than you in terms of your MHC class molecules. You don't have any way um, to, per se, um, understand what someone's genetics are, right? And so again, one thing, I'll, I'll make a general comment first, which is if you get the chance, you should watch the documentary, The Science of Sex Appeal. The Science of Sex Appeal is just, I think one of the best documentaries I've ever seen, uh, science notwithstanding. Because uh, they talk about this, and this is something that's now been known for decades, is that interestingly enough, one's smell can help the opposite sex, or at least I should say, a man's smell can help a woman uh, with her sense of smell basically enhance her probability of finding someone who is genetically different than, than they are. And so the way the experiment works is they let men wear a t-shirt that kind of accumulated their smell, and then they ask the women, do you like the smell of these t-shirts, right? And again, when you think about this experiment, the first thing you think is, boy, aren't all sweaty shirts, all, aren't all sweaty shirts stinky? But in fact, because of this system having been set up, some women do find the smell of certain men pleasant. And again, this is, he didn't do this in the original study, but it's been shown later that when a woman is more towards her fertile period of her cycle, this, this sense of smell becomes enhanced. So it's actually very, very specifically related to the idea of sexual reproduction. And so again, they measured this, and the, the amounts of diversity in the MHC genes was, was more variable between the pair. And so again, this is, it's, you know, it's important not only to have genetic diversity, but also to be able to display your genetic diversity. Yeah, so, and so to me, just ask is, you know, increase diversity based on smell mating. And in fact, there are now companies that are setting up, you know, like, you know, match.com type companies that basically incorporates the smell of someone into your mating selection. And so, you know, it's kind of a funny twist of it, but this is where science now starts helping, again, direct the way the culture responds to this. Um, okay. Yeah, and tagline mentions, we actually do have very good sense of smells. And the key thing is, is that there are neuronal pathways that relate this to the idea of what we find attractive in a mate, right? And these are things that, of course, evolution would establish because they are incredibly valuable for survival. Okay, so another example of biodiversity. Again, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and remind you that humans are a branch on the hominid tree, and then specifically hominins, which are the ones that have a more upright stance. And we're all primates. Uh, again, we really are the only surviving group of that. But really, you know, as of only 30,000 years ago, there was another branch of this part of this group known as the Neanderthals. And uh, what was accepted as common wisdom was that Neanderthals were brutish, savage, and a lower form of human than even the corresponding people at the time, and that they were dis distinct and separate species. However, what we now know, having sequenced the genome of, of Neanderthal, again, this is groundbreaking work by, by various groups, so it's Fonte Pabo uh, is a key one, <laughs> is that we now know there are variations in our genes that came from the Neanderthals. Again, I, I don't want to go through this, but the, the, the graphic that's being shown here is this idea of Neanderthals being a separate branch that had a common ancestor about um, 800,000 years ago with humans, or sorry, with what we consider Homo sapiens. But somewhere in that interval, somewhere in the last 100,000 years, there was an actual interbreeding and intercrossing between Neanderthals in Europe 
with the Homo sapiens of the time. And so, um, yeah, so Ben, one thing what we need in, in, in lots of things is basically smell of vision, the equivalent of smell of vision for human interactions. Uh, and so, you know, if you were to actually go get your DNA, if anybody here who's of European descent and Caucasian, and you got your DNA tested by, say, 23andMe or someone, or some other similar com company, they would tell you that there's actually Neanderthal DNA in your bloodstream. And this comes back to the idea of, like, polar bears and grizzly bears, that the amount of divergence was not enough that you could not have viable offspring. Again, you would not typically intermate. You would see yourselves potentially different species, but it was still possible, and in fact, we know it did happen. Now, what is the value, or wh why is this something that, um, uh, in here. And again, yeah, uh, Mike Shaw mentions uh, the Denisovans, and I, I, I didn't really want to complicate the talk since I'm now about two minutes out from finishing. But there's also another subgroup of, of uh, distinct hominids, uh, uh, humans, known as Denisovans. Uh, again, information that came from a tooth found, I think, in Siberia. Uh, again, what we now have been, what research, researchers now have been looking at in more fine detail is what is the prevalence of these Neanderthal alleles? Uh, what can we say about what genes are related to? And it, what it seems to be the case is that there are distinct genes related to skin pigmentation. Again, the Neanderthals were in a northern climate and had adapted to it before the African ancestry came out. Um, and also genes related to uh, immunity. So again, I haven't gone through to catalog the specific genes. I don't know if some of them have to do with MEC class diversity or other genes involved in, say, uh, antibodies or T cells or B cells or whatnot. But uh, I think one thing we should really be very careful to recognize is that the actual interbreeding with what we would call a different species, not even a different race, a different species, has been something that has helped the survival of humankind. So again, an example of biodiversity being, again, a valuable trait, and that the idea of um, you know, some sort of racial purity as a benefit is extremely unlikely. Okay, so, um, and this is kind of my summary talk. The summary of the talk, the main point, is that diversity in human genes is a key factor in creating selective advantages for the survival of the species. And uh, anything that kind of contradicts that particular uh, process in general is not a, uh, is not moving us towards long-term survival. Again, especially if, you know, civilization, the environment were to collapse and we were back to a more, um, you know, brutal, brutal survival. We were really, I mean, again, we have ways of medically and technologically intervening in things that our genetics have tended us towards. So cystic fibrosis, antibiotics are great for people with cystic fibrosis. Uh, we have ways of helping people with hemoglobin to survive longer. Uh, but technology goes away, we need to have this genetic diversity. And so uh, in terms of a perspective that I have on the future of this going, um, I'll get back to your question in a minute, Tagline. Um, so in terms of future perspectives on biodiversity, you know, we have this technology where we can now actually select mates and know their genetics or even know their MAC class diversity by smell. Again, we can do this technologically intervene. And, you know, we can actually somewhat, in terms of our specific offspring, remove, um, remove harmful alleles from the population. And we can even do this with uh, a gene editing technique, something known as CRISPR, is something we can go in with genetic cells. And right now, nobody is doing this in terms of the human germline, but we have this capacity eventually probably to do that. Um, but I think one thing to keep in mind is that if we, if we really go all in, is it possible that if you look at things like sickle fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, could we accidentally remove from the population things that in the right environments are actually beneficial? So I think that's one thing is that uh, I mean, just the whole idea of a racially pure or a template or a perfect genome is nonsense because of different conditions around the world. So again, is dark skin better than, than light skin physically? It really depends on how much sunlight you're getting, for example. Again, uh, so I'm not really, so the Cro-Magnon, I'm not familiar with the genetics of that tagline asked about Neanderthals and, and the Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon, I don't know much about that particular branch. Um, I, although I think they are considered anatomically human, 
and they would be, you know, earlier in time. So I would imagine they would have been able to interpret it. Again, it's not something I'm not very anthropo anthropology uh, capable, I should say. All right, so um, last point again, and this is, oddly enough, this was the slide I ended up with last time I gave a talk, talking about genome editing, is that, you know, one thing we have to be very careful about, once we start introducing the idea of what are better genetics, even if it's just to make sure people aren't developing sickle cell anemia and modern technology or malaria keeps, or, you know, drugs keep us, help keep us away from malaria. You know, one thing we don't want to do is have a class warfare based on genetics and the people who have more access to uh, genetic testing and genetic, you know, modification, that that becomes, again, a reversal of class warfare. So again, coming back to the idea of, say, Victorian England um, and the, the Klan and social Darwinism, that is not ultimately something we want to be, be, be moving towards. So uh, with that, uh, so, so I, I, I fully took the hour, unfortunately, I meant to leave some more time for questions, but I am, I'm not obligated to anything, so I'll stay and answer any questions or have any discussion for, for a little while. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming. And it's nice to see a lot of you. Okay, so let's see. Um, glad you enjoyed it, Jess. Okay, so um, you know, one person that I um, was mentioning and cited in terms of Hitler, and again, it's also what's called the Wannsee Protocol that the, the, the Nazi regime came up with to deal with the final solution for the Jews. Is something that Stephen Jay Gould was um, very. Um, Wrote, again, I, I'm signing that for one of my sources for talking about Hitler. Um, I think they go ahead and just mention in, in chat quickly because Stephen Jay Gould is someone who, again, if you haven't read Stephen Jay Gould, there are some some areas where people kind of, in a modern sense, disagree with him. But he eloquent writer, eloquent writer, and a lot of his stuff is actually free on the uh, the web. Yeah, so actually, um, I'll just jump in really quick day, day is that Mis Mismeasure of Man is one of Stephen Jay Gould's well-known essays. And he also specifically talks about uh, Broca. You might have even heard of a disease known as Broca's aphasia. He was someone who did brain anatomy. And yeah, one thing that he did, and Stephen Jay Gould lays this out very nicely, is that he knew whether someone was white or black before he made measurements of, say, brain size or cranial shape and whatnot. And so he really developed a large body of fraudulent data. 
And so, um, but you are absolutely correct is that, and this is like the reverse of science, right? Is that you have the conclusion that you want. And if you're not a proper scientist, you bias your answer the way you do your data in a way to answer things the way you want. And I think that anybody who's been properly trained in science and has been a practitioner of science is that you have to guard against this because it's relatively easy to do. You can do it subconsciously. It's not necessarily with intent, uh, but really the best scientists are very skeptical of their own ideas constantly or their own conclusions. Not, they're not skeptical of their ideas, they're skeptical of their conclusions. I'm really jealous. I wish I had, had, could have had a chance to meet Stephen J. Gould. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, oh, uh, well, okay, so they say that they were done that intentionally. Again, I don't know broadly with Stephen Jay Gould. I'm just mentioning specifically Broco. Um, you know. But that, I, I, I have no doubt that that would be common for many of the scientists at the time. Yeah, so tagline, again, just to mention, that's the best type of science you're doing typically is something that is a blind study, or even clinically better, a double blind study, that the people who take measurements and data don't know what groups people fall into, and the people who actually analyze the data didn't know how the data was collected. So Ariana asks a question about Recessive heredity, is it necessary or unnecessary for humans? And, you know, in terms of, I mean, it's a process. It's something that I, I should I should point out that what we refer to as recessive mutations is kind of a, const, a construct way of describing how we phenotypically inherit, how, I'm sorry, the inheritance pattern, that's an inheritance pattern. And in all these types of cases, as you're affecting the way a gene works with mutations, it can present in a recessive way. Like you have one working copy, but a non-working copy, and the working copy is sufficient. But there's actually a wide variety of inheritance patterns and a wide variety of way that mutations affect the functions of genes. And so, again, there's not necessarily, there's, there's not an idea of recessive this being Necessary or unnecessary, it's just a description of what we see in the patterns. Now, again, you're asking, again, so you mentioned the term here for artificial abortion or selecting, you know, who lives or dies based on mutations. Uh, is that something that is eugenics? Uh, and eugenics, as kind of originally coined in the late, I think in the 1880s, I'm blanking on the name of the guy, um, and then also, there actually was a journal of eugenics in the 1940s in America. It was a very common thought. You know, it depends on what you, you mean by it, right? You know, this idea that you can use match.com or some sort of genetic profile of someone, you know, in a sense, you can become a common practitioner of eugenics, right? And it depends on what you're trying to do. Like, if, I think if you're trying to promote diversity, that's a good point. If you're trying to avoid individually your child having a specific disease, right, genetic testing, those are individually good things. But the question of, you know, if we were to eliminate the cystic fibrosis allele out of the population entirely, and then say civilization collapsed, and then cholera became a pandemic again, that would be bad. That would actually be bad for our survival. So it's it's complicated, right? It's very contextual. Anytime you talk about these genetics and population and evolution, things are very contextual. Okay, let's see. Kay 
uh, let's see, K says, to end racism, decree that your ancestors came over to America's over the Bering Land Bridge, or after that, you should go back to where you came from. So again, this is kind of an idea that, you know, if you weren't, if you aren't essentially a Clovis derived person or a you know, Native American, you don't belong here. But again, I, and I know you're being joking, but yeah. migrations and patterns have happened. Nobody really gets to say that this planet or this particular land should be theirs in terms of the survival of the species, I think. But we do build political boundaries. We do have what we consider, you know, ours versus theirs. Um, oh, that would, that would, oh, oh. Well, wait, when did the, so Native Americans are derived from Chinese ancestry? And that was, that was after Bering Bridge as well? I thought that was related. Oh, okay. Again, things are the way they are. And I think we have to move on from, from where things are at this point. Promoting diversity, promoting everyone having the opportunity to um, contribute. Yeah, Europeans and their ideas. Yeah, I, I think one thing too, just to keep in mind when we talk about, and a part of the caution I have about um, genetic engineering or biasing things is that it can make perfect sense from an individual point of view to say, let's not do this. But unless you really know all the consequences of a particular gene mutation, it, it, you, can, you should, at some level, be very cautious. Like, I, I think one thing that's probably fair to to think about is can we avoid getting certain diseases where as far as we can tell right we'd only want to get rid of diseases that as far as we can tell have absolutely zero upside in any context but it's really hard to know that right that's the type of thing that's almost impossible to know So, I don't know, any other specific questions about the talk? Thank you, Chantel, for the opportunity to present. All right, I think um, a lot of people here still. Again, tagline talks about human longevity. You know, we do know there are genetics related to longevity. Uh, they're actually even trying to, anybody who lives and becomes a centenarian, they're actually trying to sequence and analyze their DNA to get a catalog of what genetic factors they may have that are useful for longevity, and as well as what lifestyle factors they have. Uh, you know, longevity is great, but living a happy, productive lifestyle, like the longer you live, things happen to your body. So I think I would focus on trying to have it be more productive and contribute to more happiness. Um, yeah, and if you read any sort of like science fiction literature, this idea comes always back around that if you don't have the fear of death and you can live really long times, what does that do to the population dynamics? You know, that can be really complicated. Well, okay, so I mean, one thing that um, has been kind of some interesting recent news is talking about the contributions of grandparents to the survival of, 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 of like offspring. And so there was a study of the, I don't know who did it, a study of the Canadian census. And they actually saw, again, they only have census data to work with. So they have geography and how long people live. But they actually showed that, or what they saw was a correlation between 
grandparents that live within close proximity, those offspring had longer lifespans. And so I think one thing we should really always keep in mind is that, you know, healthy older people can both, again, contribute to the family unit, but also in theory can contribute contribute wisdom and perspective. Well, it's hard to say, I mean, not always. <laughs> Still a good number of people hanging out. Thanks for coming, Mike. Glad you came. Glad you took time out of your Saturday. Yeah, again, I, I hope I, I, how many, so actually, let me ask a quick question of the remainder. How many people knew about the vitamin D light pigmentation relationship? Is there anyone who, who knew about that already? Yeah. Yeah, and that, I, you know, I used to teach at the college level and I was usually, I was frequently surprised by how few, um, even biology majors knew that. Yeah, albinism is a funny thing, and I didn't, I didn't go much too, too much into it. Albinism, which again are mutations earlier in pigment biosynthetic pathways, um, things having to do with I think the conversion of tyrosine to these pigments. Uh, yeah, so you don't even have eye pigment, you don't have hair color pigment, you don't have skin color pigment. The relationship of how they very easily get cancer is a part of the, the, the rationale for why pigmentation is useful. Yeah, I think I used to know the specific chemistry of the interaction. It makes specifically vitamin D3. So, yeah, I mean, people, I think a lot of people do understand the relationship between darker skin and avoiding sunburn and cancer. But the fact that there's a flip side to it for wickets is not something people appreciate very much. But here we are all drinking vitamin D milk, right? Vitamin D milk, why is that there? I suspect that a lot of science teachers just don't want to get into the issue. Especially at the high school level. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, we don't we don't know the genetics of metachlorine uh, prevalence. I can't can't claim any knowledge of that. But one can wonder. Melanoma, that's specifically a skin cancer. Um, you know, the funny thing actually, okay, so I'll tell a quick quick point about this, is that melanoma is named because the cancer has a very dark coloration to it and a very dark growth. Um, and that's because of, a, you know, a rapid growth of a melanocyte and other issues. But one thing that's kind of funny about it is that 
the melanin has absolutely nothing to do with the cancer. And it was funny, I actually saw a research presented at the American Society for Human Genetics annual meeting, where what they essentially did was they tried to develop antibodies that would, just, that would target melanin and thus hopefully eliminate these high melanin cells. And it, it kind of worked, it actually did retard the, the growth of the cancer. It did, um, but it didn't cure the cancer. The cancer, the cell growth wise come back because they weren't addressing the core function of what was a cancer cell. However, they did invent a cure for freckles. So if you're someone out there who really hates their freckles, you might have a solution for that now. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I'm generally pretty good about not getting too much sun, but I don't know. My college days could always come back to haunt me. I am rather light of skin. Well, yeah, so take one mentions Alzheimer's disease, and there are two complications there. Is that one is very hard to deliver um, <laughs> therapeutic treatments to the brain that deal with those plaques. And the other thing that's a little bit complicated about Alzheimer's is we're not really quite sure the relationship of the beta amyloid plaques to the actual cause and development of the Alzheimer's in all cases. So, you know, mutations in EPO, uh, EPO E gene or EPO A gene that's related to processing of beta amyloid are related and seem to be causative for some types of Alzheimer's. But in some cases, those tangles and fibrils may just be a, a, a symptom, not necessarily a cause of the disease. So uh, Alzheimer's is horribly complicated. I mean, and the main reason why is that it's really hard to analyze or diagnose until after the person's dead. I mean, in terms of the physiology of it. Oh, I, okay, I haven't heard about the aluminum. Yeah, also, I mean, with, the, with some exception, I don't, I don't know what percentage of them are, are known to have a genetic cofactor, but I think it's actually less than half. So the fact that there could be environmental inducers of it is something worth studying. Can I return anytime soon? Well, you need to present, I, I presume. Um, you know, certainly. I actually, I used to teach an honors philosophy history of science class for, uh, that was very much discussion based and I had a lot of presentations related to that. So, um, you know, probably with, with minimal effort I could, could also repackage those and it could we could just have zoot fly month i have a really great talk talking about basically trying to destroy the idea of um uh shoot uh intelligent design by talking about the parallels with gun development handgun and we could always talk about luminary scientists i've done and I think there was one talk we we talked before. I, there was a talk I did that the recording didn't work. And if, I need to find out which one that was. Well, no, but there's even a one earlier than that too. I think. I think there was another talk like a couple of years ago that didn't get recorded. 
So we doing the CRISPR one would be would be good. I don't know how many people know about that. Should I come back and give another presentation about another topic? Uh, yeah, let me answer tagline's quick question of, do I think humans are going to make it? You know, there's no species, there's no individual specific species that lives really more than, I think, 10 million years. You know, uh, we know trilobites lived for, you know, hundreds of millions of years. Um, species always change. So, I mean, if you want to say humans, you know, it's a really hard to call. But I think that also goes a little bit beyond the idea of biology. I mean, I think anybody who thinks about alien civilizations and alien planets and this uh, concept known as the, um, oh, shoot, I'm blanking on the scientist's name, I'm not Turing, um, the principle that, that intelligent life always, Fermi, the Fermi paradox, yes, Fermi paradox, thank you area that you know how can we haven't seen alien life as far as we know as far as been you know revealed to us uh intelligent life may always be self-destructive in the end you know so who knows i don't know. all right thanks for coming carry on that is an early time to be at a science circle talk glad you made it All right. See, so, yeah, I think I need to. I'm gonna head out. Thanks for coming. Um, I'll try and get. We'll coordinate with Chantel to uh, get the materials released so that everyone can can see them. Have a great weekend, everyone.